Lansing Steel. Ever heard of it? According to my calculations, 92.4% of you haven't. So, I'm here to bring it into the limelight with the build guide for my Lansing Steel Deadeye. Welcome, it's your friendly neighborhood Badger here, and I'm back with a new build guide for the 3.13 Echoes of the Atlas expansion, the Lansing Steel Deadeye. Given the current meta of crazy explosions and MTX proliferations, it's finally nice to have a build that doesn't send you into a fit three times a map. But that's not the only thing this build can do. Reaching endgame levels of DPS with nothing but a tabula rasa and a terminus est, this build is like shooting swords out of a machine gun. We will be going over each variation of this build, from two-handed budget to dual-wield endgame, and by golly do we reach some pretty respectable DPS numbers from a couple of choice unique pickups. If you want to jump to any specific section, check below for the color bar. Navigation is easy, just click on the timeline corresponding to the right color. But I've got a lot to teach you about this build, so let's get into it. Alright, today we're just going to start with a gameplay overview of how this character works and steel skills in general. Because there's a few interesting mechanics you must really know about steel skills to be able to pull the most DPS out of builds such as this. For uh, most steel skills, well all steel skills, you grant a uh, skill called Call of Steel right here. Now, Call of Steel is going to give you steel shards, but let me show you just to begin with what attacking with Lancing Steel looks like without any steel shards. Pretty pitiful, not very many uh, projectiles whatsoever. You can see that right there. Now what Call of Steel does is if I use Call of Steel, I grant steel shards. Each of these three swords here is four steel shards, and these four steel shards can be uh, consumed. One attack of Lancing Steel consumes four steel shards to add a bunch more projectiles to your actual attack. As you can see here, we get a bunch more projectiles. And then the second one there, and then the third one there as well. So that's how that all works with the Call of Steel mechanic. So obviously on bosses, what you're gonna need to do is get all of your Call of Steels up, you know, use all three of them. You can let them all recharge, uh, or you can even just do something like attack, Call of Steel, attack, Call of Steel, attack, while, you know, moving around, dodging the boss, all that kind of stuff. I'm out of mana there, but you, you get the gist of what I was actually saying. That's pretty much how the gameplay goes right there. Now, uh, obviously you can use things like greater multiple projectiles to add even more projectiles uh, right there. And projectile scaling on this build is extremely strong. For clearing, however, I have found that using chain is a little bit better. Um, although uh, you can definitely play around yourself between GMP, LMP and chain for this build, however it will feel. Now the last thing, right before we jump into this sepulchre map, I'm just bringing up on the screen a radius circle. Now this radius circle is of 70, uh, as per this image that you do see in front of you. And 70 is the maximum range in which you get the maximum DPS from the new far shot, which is one of the Deadeye Ascendancy nodes. Or in the end game of this build, you'll also be using the Bell Timber Blade, which also gives far shot to this upgraded thing. So at 70 range, you're getting 60% more damage on your skills. This is uh, really, really important that on bosses, you stick around about this distance away from the enemies uh, to get the most damage. If you go about halfway in, you get about you know 25%, 30% more damage. Uh, so you're still getting more damage most of the time until you're actually really, really close to the enemies, which you don't want to be. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to fade that image down uh, so it's actually you know the same size, representative of what my screen is right now. We're going to run that map uh, right here with a faded version of that circle so you can just get a gist of how far away from enemies you need to be to get that maximum distance. However, let's go right into the map here and you can see how it all functions. Now, the last thing I will mention right before we start attacking, once again, this build uh, is about a third of the damage of the actual budget build, just because uh, all of the new Deadeye Ascendancies, and I'm using some pretty uh, crappy uh, abilities uh, here, or what I mean is not really leveled abilities. Uh, so the damage that you see here is going to be about one third of the actual uh, DPS of the budget version. So we're all ready. I'm going to start attacking and it will start chaining here. So you can see here, I'll try and stay away from this rare. Oh, it's instantly dead. We didn't even see it. So we'll go on. We can leap slam for our, uh, uh, for our fortify. For most mobs, you actually don't need to be too far, um, uh, too far away from them. You can even, you can even see me sometimes. I'll even just jump into a pack like this 
and hit them. It doesn't matter too much with far shot. It's mainly on the bosses that you want to be standing really far away. Uh, so that's pretty much how it all goes. Another amazing thing for Lancing Steel, as you may have realized, um, life gain on hit is absolutely insane for this build. Really, really, really strong. Uh, so we'll jump through all of here. I'll try to go a bit faster so you can see how it all looks there. So we use Call of Steel periodically just to get the rest of our Steel skills back. Maybe even just use one attack on packs so they all chain together. Basically, we're just wiping up everything. Uh, you can see I'm kind of leaving packs alone, but that's because the uh, the Lancing Steel is actually clearing up the packs um, because they stay as little turrets. As you can see here, I can use this, uh, and I can just walk away from it like a little turret, and it will clear up the rest of it. All right, we're going to get our Call of Steels up. I'm just going to show you on this boss arena. Once again, the damage is uh, about one-third of what you actually will be achieving on the, on the new patch, but we can still see that it's fairly respectable boss DPS. So I'm just going to jump here, use my Diamond Flask, and use that right about there. Do one more Call of Steel, and then like that, the enemy is dead. So I only would have needed to attack about three or four times on that boss there to deal the full DPS to kill that boss. Uh, and uh, usually Doedry is a little bit annoying when they go into the middle, they get a little bit of damage reduction, but we wiped straight through all of that with the build. So that is the gameplay overview. Now we're going to jump into the budget version of this build. Really, really budget. The only thing that's going to cost anything is Terminus Est. And then we're going to move on uh, to the end game uh, gear. And then looking at the links and then totally onto the passive skill tree. So there's a couple of differences in the passive skill trees there because we're using uh, two-handed swords for the budget version and dual wielding for the end game version. Let's jump over to that right now. Right here in front of you, I have brought up the budget version of this build on the new 3.13 updated path of building. Now in the link below, there is a link to this path of building, but you must make sure that you have the, the final upgraded version of the community fork of path of building. Otherwise this will not work. I'll also include that link down below if you don't have the community fork. Now, right here, you can see that our DPS is pretty darn insane, about 2.8 million. Now, as I did state before, that's not the effective DPS because you are going to be moving and regaining your steel shards every now and then. I would say this is closer to around about 2 million DPS effectively against bosses. Uh, however, that's still absolutely insane for the types of items that we do have on this build right here. So we're going to go through everything. Now, I have mentioned to begin with, Terminus Est is basically best in slot as a budget item here. This is giving you frenzy charges, a great amount of crit, and a pretty respectable attack speed and physical DPS uh, right here. And to top it all off, you get a little bit of move speed as well. Now, Terminus Est uh, is, uh, as I said, the budget version. Uh, and uh, you are also going to want a tabula rasa or even a corrupted six link with the colors uh, that you do need, which is four green and two red, remember that. But a tabula rasa is uh, basically all you do really need right here. That's gonna allow for your six link, which is gonna allow you to zoom through the game. If you are playing on hardcore, uh, this build is a pretty uh, pretty okay for hardcore, but just be aware that um, you're going to probably not wanna use tabula rasa and maybe just run on a five link with a bit more life right there. Now the helmet itself, and actually all of the gear, apart from a couple of exceptions, is just basically life and resistances. Life and resistances for gloves, boots, but obviously you want move speed on your boots. Uh, and then your two rings, you can have some uh, physical damage to attacks on these rings, is really, really nice. That gives you a little bit of DPS, uh, but just life and resistances as well. And then the belt, life and resistances. The only thing that I will say, an extremely budget amulet right here, this is a level five amulet that you will most likely drop in your leveling process, uh, is a Karui Ward. If you don't drop this in your leveling process, you can buy it for about one chaos on day one, or maybe even one alchemy. We can see that with Karui Ward right here, just this amulet is giving us 11% more DPS and it gives us move speed as well. So this is gonna just allow you, this setup right here is a big zooming setup. Uh, the flasks, look, we're just looking for a Divine Life Flask of Staunching, then just a Diamond Flask, a Basalt Flask, uh, an Alchemist Quicksilver Flask, and a Jade Flask right here. This is probably the best setup, both defensively and offensively. Offensively, uh, sorry. Diamond Flask is needed for a crit build like this. Our DPS really does get improved quite a lot with a Diamond Flask. As you can see here, we'll just turn the crit chance lucky off. Uh, right here we go from 2.1 to 2.8, so it's a very, very strong upgrade there. But you can get Diamond Flask extremely easy uh, through an Act 7 quest. 
and then lastly, uh, we do have uh, the Crimson Jewel right here, you know, a standard rare jewel that you could be using for this build, uh, which is just Global Fizz Damage, Attack Speed, Max Life. It's very generic. There's a lot of other options that you can go into, uh, and we'll talk a little bit that, about that in the end game uh, gear of um, section like cluster jewels everything like that although uh, I'm not going to be talking about the specific cluster jewels you can use because there's too much variation there and I would like you guys to experiment with uh, with that with yourself um, so that's everything on the budget version the last thing I will mention a really really tasty pickup is the Lord of Steel jewel with uh, increased reflected AoE uh, of Call of Steel and call speed or call use, uh, call of steel use time. Uh, that's going to really, really help you uh, with your speed of using your call of steel. Uh, and the gameplay that you did see before, I was using the call of steel uh, gem in there, and it was extremely strong just to be able to allow me to cast call of steel as much as possible. That's the budget gear. You can expect to pay uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 chaos uh, on day one for this gear, unless Terminus Est is uh, quite hotly contested, which I do think it will be. There's quite a few uh, prominent community members who do like this sword. Uh, so it might be a little bit more, but uh, just a little bit of farming uh, before Terminus Est. All you're really just going to be using is any other unique two-handed sword that you can get your hands on, or even just a, a two-handed axe, a two-handed weapon, two-handed sword, anything like that is just going to really uh, be absolutely fine for you. Just make sure it's got good fizz damage and a little bit of crit, and you will be fine. Now, let's move on to the end game version of this build. All right, it's time for the end game gear on this character. Keep in mind this is guidelines. This is not the exact best way that you can play this. And I will talk about a little uh, bit of other ways that you could go about this. But I have decided both for clear and for some pretty insane damage, uh, we're going to be dual wielding two different unique uh, weapons. Now, first of all, right here, we're going to be using the Bell Timber Blade. Now, what Bell Timber Blade does is you, you get two additional projectiles if you've used a movement skill recently. And this also does grant you far shot. Now, what this does mean is uh, both of these are giving you a massive increase of damage, and you can actually change your ascendancy points on the main tree for uh, this build when you do take a Bell Timber Blade. It's giving you a really, really massive uh, DPS increase right there. And then the second thing that we will be using is actually the Savior Sword. Now the Savior is a sword that actually gives you uh, a reflection when equipped. So what this means is when you attack with a skill, uh, you'll grant a reflection that will also attack with that skill. You can also grant another reflection that will attack with that skill as well. Uh, which is pretty darn interesting uh, and has some pretty great clear and boss damage on the Savior right here. So uh, I think that this is probably the best balance between uh, quality of life and damage. You can definitely get a bunch more damage. As you can see here, we're on 8.2 million. If you go for a double Bell Timber Blade, go up to about 10.7. And you can even probably get more than that uh, with probably a GG crafted two-handed sword. But you can't go much further than this. However, with Savior and Bell Timber, your effective DPS is much higher because of those Savior clones. Uh, now the rest of the gear is looking pretty uh, pretty juicy. Basically we've just got a really nice uh, helmet gear with maximum life and increased effective fortify on you because we're going to be applying fortify with our leap slam. You can also even craft this on the new base. I can't remember the name of the base, but basically the base is also giving you more increased effect of fortify while lowering uh, your effective uh, physical damage reduction. But on a build like this we're full about evasion, so physical damage reduction is not the best thing for us anyway. Uh, the body armor itself, uh, we have a pretty insane body armor here, but this is something to strive for. And once again, this is going to make your clear just astronomically crazy. Uh, giving you attacks to critical strike, a chance, and the explode mod uh, for this assassin's garb is going to be extremely tasty. And then some life and resistances on there as well. Now, obviously, this is a very good chest piece. You're not uh, expected to get this anytime soon within the game, but it's one of the best things that you can equip for the build. Gloves are a totally uh, a little bit, well, not as crazy. We can get some Hunter gloves right here. Chance to Intimidate on hit is a really nice stat. Just gives a little bit more damage here. And we can see we don't actually have Intimidated uh, tagged right over here. We get even more DPS if we hit uh, Intimidated right there, as you can see. 
Uh, and then basically just life and resistances in there as well. The boots, we're looking at elusive on critical strike. That's gonna be a really, really nice buff uh, to even uh, make us survive even more. Uh, and then chaos resistance, lightning resistance, uh, or any sorts of resistances you want with some move speed and life is super, super nice. The amulet is pretty insane as well. Uh, I just went full into damage with a little bit of life as well. Basically, you're just mainly looking that, for the stat or physical damage to attacks. And then if you can get any of the three stats or if you can get them together, attack speed, crit strike chance and global crit multi, that's going to give you a lot of DPS. And then lastly, the rings themselves. You're just looking for some really nicely rolled steel rings, uh, preferably elder items to give you life gained for each enemy hit by your attacks. Now, two of these rings uh, with a bunch of projectiles is just going to mean that you're basically going to stay uh, topped off on life without ever really needing to think about it at all. Now, a really interesting choice uh, for the belt is actually the Nomad studded belt. The Nomad belt itself is actually giving you a bunch of increased global physical damage and increased projectile attack damage when you have at least 200 dexterity and a bunch of resistances uh, while you have at least 200 strength as well. Now, you do miss out on a little bit of life, but this is going to give you basically, uh, if we actually have a look here, we'll take it off and then put it back on. Uh, with medium rolls, this gives you close to 20% more damage on this endgame build. A very, very nice spot for a, a really nice belt in here. And then lastly, most of the flasks are the same, but I've switched out a Basalt Flask for a Dying Sun Flask. So a Dying Sun uh, is going to give us two additional projectiles, which is very nice. And a Basalt Flask, if we are using the helmet that gives us the crushed debuff to get less physical damage uh, reduction, a Basalt Flask isn't that necessary anyway. So Dying Sun is just ex uh, Dying Sun, sorry, is uh, extremely crazy for the damage it does give. As we can see here, it gives another 20% damage just for two projectiles. That's a lot of damage right there for you. So that's the end game gear, uh, and the only other thing I would mention is a Thread of Hope, but I'm going to talk about that in the Passive Skill Tree section, uh, which is right after Link's section, which we're going to move into right now. Now the links themselves, is it's fairly straightforward in how this build does function. First of all, we're going to start with the actual six link you will be using. And that is going to be Lancing Steel, obviously your main skill, linked with Impale, Brutality, Vicious Projectiles, and Maim for a five link. Uh, now you can also swap out Maim for lesser multiple projectiles, greater multiple projectiles. Uh, you can even use Chain, you can use slower projectiles, Crit Strike. There's a bunch of things that you can use in this slot. And I would actually say to you, definitely experiment to see what you find the best. Some people would say that greater multiple projectiles feels nicer because you get more projectiles. Some would say chain feels nicer for clear, uh, but I would actually, anywhere between lesser and, and greater multiple projectiles are the two that I mainly like to use myself. This is also for life gain on hit purposes. It's extremely nice. Uh, we're then going to move on to the first four link, which is going to be our ancestral protector linked with multiple totems and culling strike. Uh, that's just going to basically uh, keep us uh, really topped off there. If you don't like the attack speed of Ancestral Protector, you can also use Ancestral War Chief to give you more uh, just increased damage, which is pretty strong. And then lastly, a Sniper's Mark. Now, Sniper's Mark is something that we will be cursing ourselves on bosses. And Sniper's Mark, I'll just take a second to talk a little bit about how that's going to work. We do get 75% increased effect of marks on our enemies uh, with the new Deadeye uh, Ascendancies. And uh, we're also getting some uh, increased effect of marks on enemies from the passive skill tree itself. You can see Sniper's Mark itself is giving you 40%, uh, uh, cursed enemies take 40% increased damage from projectile hits, and you gain uh, life and mana flask charges from this as well. And projectiles which hit cursed enemies split towards four additional targets. Now, basically, with 100% uh, increased cursed effect, which we're going to get, or mark effect, that is not four additional targets, but eight additional targets. What this also means is that in boss fight arenas, such as the new 10 boss fight arena, we're going to be using Sniper's Mark on one enemy and then attacking them and splitting all of those projectiles to a bunch of other enemies around the arena, which is going to be absolutely uh, crazy. You're gonna see projectiles flying everywhere, then coupled with the uh, chain bouncing off walls, uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting things that do happen with this build. So expect some pretty crazy stuff uh, going on there. Now we move on to our aura setup. 
So basically we've got War Banner and then Precision. I like to keep Precision around level 10 so I have enough mana to cast my uh, Lancing Steel. Then we're using Herald of Purity and Summon Skitterbots. Now one interesting thing that you may notice is we're not using Pride. Now Pride is not being used because uh, we want to stay outside of that 70 range. Uh, and Pride is actually a little bit less than that. Now you could still run Pride if you wanted to with 20% uh, quality to give it that extra area. Uh, but that's the reason we don't use Pride. And also Flesh and Stone. Both of those are, are things that would be nice for the build, but we're not actually usually sitting in that distance. So I've actually opted for a combination of War Banner, Precision, Herald of Purity, and Summon Skitterbots. You get a relatively similar damage output anyway. So it's still totally fine. Then moving on to our cast when damage taken setup. I like to keep this one at about level 15. So then we've got a level 18 steel skin, a uh, level, uh, it shouldn't be level 20 blood rage. I'm so sorry there. That should actually be uh, level uh, 17 blood rage and then a level 15 summon lightning golem. Now this is just gonna mean that our blood rage is always up and we're gonna get the frenzy charges up as much as we can, uh, uh, which is really, really interesting. And you can even use the um, uh, anomalous uh, blood Rage to then get uh, additional Frenzy Charges when hitting unique enemies. That's just another big buff there. Lastly, we have our Leap Slam in a 3 link. Now, Leap Slam is linked to Fortify and Faster Attacks. This is just uh, super nice to just leap around the map. As you can see in the map uh, that we were doing and all the gameplay, our Leap Slam is very fast. But you must make sure if you are using the end game version, if you're using Bell Timber Blade, that you do Leap Slam at least once every four seconds, which is going to be totally easy to do, just to keep that additional projectiles up as well right there. That is everything I have to talk with about uh, the links. Uh, we're going to move into the passive skill tree now, so hopefully you enjoy that section. Now it's time to talk about the passive skill tree selection on this build. Uh, now we do have the budget version, the end game version, because they are different because we're using uh, two-handed sword and then dual wielding. Then there is also a leveling guide. So you can find the leveling guide 20 points by 20 points right down here. And you can see what pathing I like to take uh, to be able to pick everything up. But first of all, we're going to start with the budget version and we're going to start with the ascendancy points. Now the ascendancy points on this 3.13 updated character uh, go a little bit like this. I do like to take Ricochet first into Endless Munitions as you're leveling with a Lancing Steel. Uh, those two nodes are really, really nice to get everything working. Uh, and then it's up to you whether you want to take Far Shot or Focal Point next. Now, Far Shot is going to mean that you're going to have to stay a bit further back from bosses, but you will get more damage out of this. However, Focal Point is going to mean that you can start using Sniper's Mark to deal insane amounts of damage really early. Uh, however, those are the points that I would take. Uh, but the end game version is a little bit different. Right before we jump to the end game version, I'm just going to show you the tree itself. So we come right out of the ranger area, picking up some life and grabbing life around here into some critical strike chance. And we are taking acrobatics, phase acrobatics, and wind dancer as three keystone notables. Now, don't forget this special node right here uh, with uh, these cursed uh, uh, notable areas or marks I should say, we've got cast speed, critical strike chance against enemies, and then marked enemies take increased damage and grant increased flash charges to you. It's a really nice little notable there, uh, but if you do need a little bit more accuracy rating, uh, you can also, uh, or sorry, make our enemies and not avoid uh, as much. You can also take that node as well right there. And basically the rest of it is picking up sword nodes and two-handed nodes, making sure you pick up some intelligence as well, because you probably will need that. And then at the end of the tree, you've got a bunch of life as well. So if you find yourself through the leveling process taking a bit of damage, then just do a little bit of rush straight through, th straight, straight through here, sorry about the mess up there, and pick up uh, things like Destroyer, uh, just the notable things here, maybe even Blade Sovereign, and then pick up all the health as quickly as possible. Uh, and lastly, Call to Arms. Now this is one thing I haven't actually fully touched on, but Call to Arms is actually really, really strong to use uh, if you want to use it or anything like Enduring Cry. Now I know I didn't showcase it in the actual build guide, but Enduring Cry is just super strong to just keep some endurance charges up and keep you topped up as well. I would uh, sometimes take this or sometimes not. It's totally up to you what you would like to do. Uh, but that's pretty much the uh, budget tree. The end game tree is very similar, apart from a couple of different changes. Obviously we come out of the uh, two-handed nodes, around about here and here, and then we take a little bit of uh, some more nodes down here with like long shot into honed edge, and then twins terrors uh, to give us some crit chance while dual wielding, more dual wielding points here. Then we're actually using a thread of hope. 
Now, Thread of Hope is interesting because it means that we can pick up Fury Bolts, Discipline of Slaughter, Discipline of Unyielding, and then these Life Nodes as well here. That's a really, really big buff to both damage and survivability. And the Discipline of Unyielding and uh, the Discipline of Slaughter is very, very nice to basically just give us that extra minimum charges uh, as we run this build. Everything else around the uh, extra area here is basically exactly the same. Uh, now, uh, that's pretty much all for all of that, apart from the Ascendancy on the endgame version. Now, because we're taking Bell Timber Blade on the endgame version, you don't actually need to spec into Farshot, because that's on the weapon itself. So I spec out of Farshot and actually spec into Gathering Winds. This is going to give us more move speed, more action speed. Uh, well, basically, action speed increases your move speed and everything like that, which is Tailwind. And then some Gale Force as well, right there. That's extremely strong. Now, in Hardcore, if you did want to play this build in Hardcore, I would actually probably spec out of uh, the Endless Munitions here and go into Wind Ward. Now, Wind Ward is going to give you a lot less damage taken per Gale Force, uh, which is really nice with a bunch of Evasion. It's extremely strong with Evasion because when you hit, get hit, uh, those small amounts of times you do actually get hit, you lose your Gale Force stacks, but then you actually uh, get a, a ton of less damage taken. So those big hits that do hit you, especially coupled with Wind Dancer, are uh, really going to do nothing to you at all. So that's basically the passive skill tree section. The last section we're going to jump to is leveling, how you would actually level this build. I'm just going to go over very quickly my way that I would level this build. Let's get into it. All right, like how we usually do this, I'm going to go through Act 1, 2, 3, and 4, tell you the best gems to level this character with and pick them all up. Uh, and then uh, you can go from there through the story pretty much with those gems and then just filling in the gaps with anything I might not have mentioned that is in the path of building. This is the necessary types of gems that I like to use for leveling this uh, Impale Lancing Steel Deadeye. Uh, but we're going to be starting with Splitting Steel. Now Splitting Steel is an ability you can pick up at level 1 uh, with Ranger and it's going to carry you pretty much through to Lancing Steel. You can use any other skills you would like to but uh, Splitting Steel is going to be extremely strong for you. So you're picking up Splitting Steel, you can even decide to pick up Pierce as well if you would like to, and then at level 4 you're getting things like War Banner, maybe even a Steel Skin, uh, and then uh, basically picking up after that at level 8 I think it is, lesser multiple projectiles or added fire damage depending on uh, whether you want more clear or more single target damage, or even Maim as well is going to be super nice right there. Uh, you can then move into something like Leap Slam, uh, or you can even use Dash right up here, or Frost Blink if you want to. And if you need a bit more survivability, you can use Vitality. So there's a few options in Act 1. Let's move to Act 2, and I'll show you what I would do next. In Act 2, things do get a little bit more interesting. Now, to start off with, we are just going to be picking up a Skitterbots, and you can either pick up like any of the Herald of Ash, Herald of Ice, or Herald of Thunder. Which ones you would like to pick up, it's totally up to you. I'd probably prefer to do Herald of Ash myself, uh, but that's, uh, that's pretty much it there. Uh, now, we can then also pick up melee physical damage, because Splitting Steel is still a melee uh, ability, but we do want to switch that out, obviously, when we get to Lancing Steel, because we're no longer using a melee ability for Lancing Steel. You can also easily pick up a Faster Attacks and a Vicious Projectiles for when you do get Lancing Steel. They're going to be really, really nice links for you. Let's go to Act 3. There's not too much to pick up in Act 3, uh, because we actually mainly want to go to the Act 3 vendor itself. Now, the only thing you're actually going to be picking up here is Lancing Steel itself. Now, this is a level 28 gem, so you get this after killing Gravicious. You can pick that one up and start using it, but I'll just quickly show you what you would also want to get from Siosa, which is uh, from the Golden Pages quest in the library. Alright, so if you've done the Siosa quest for the Golden Pages, you can then access a gem vendor for all of the gems that are available up until this point on any character. So we can pick, us, pick up some things that we weren't able to grab earlier. Those things being Ancestral Protector or even Ancestral Warchief. We can also uh, pick up Enduring Cry if you would like to. The other thing that's really, really interesting to pick up that we haven't been able to is Herald of Purity, which is another massive buff for this build. Uh, and then moving on to some uh, green gems as well. Uh, the other stuff that we do need to be picking up is uh, Sniper's Mark, which is this one right down here. Uh, and that's, look, pretty much it from what you're going to be picking up with these gems here. If I did miss any of the support gems, it's because they're not necessary, but you can look through and you can pick these up from Siosa as well. 
Lastly, we are just going to finish with the Act 4 gems. In Act 4, there's just a couple more gems to pick up. So the first one that you do want to pick up is a Lightning Golem. This is going to help with some attack speed. But if you do want some more Crit Strike Chance, you can use Ice Golem, or you can use Flame Golem as well, just for more generic damage. You can also pick up a Chain or a Greater Multiple Projectile, depending on what playstyle you would like to use for your Lancing Steel. And then lastly, I'd just pick up a Cast When Damage Taken Support and Multiple Totem Support as well, to link with all of the skills that you do need. That is everything uh, to do with the level process from this point you can have all the gems that you do need apart from some supports you might just want to jump to Siosa to pick up but everything else is going to be totally quick and easy through the leveling process I hope you enjoy this build let's get to the end thank you everyone for watching that was the Lansing Steel Deadeye build guide let me know in the comments below if you're going to give this one a go or let me know if you're going to try something else I always say to people even though I put out build guides play what you think you would enjoy so thank you so much for watching if you want to catch me live on League Start it's twitch.tv slash this is Badger Gaming you can come and check us out there is links down below and remember hit that subscribe button so you can get the rest of the build videos and anything else that comes out from this point. Until next time, Badger, out.